Father, we thank you so much that we can come into your presence, and we're in your presence all the time, but we thank you so much for reminding us of that reality. We're the ones who forget, naturally. You're with us every step of the way, every breath we take, Lord, you are there. But yet we get busy and, and uh, focused on other things, and, and in balance, that's fine. We thank you, Lord, tonight that we can just take a rest and sit at your feet tonight and just open up the book of Psalms. Psalm 105 and 106, Lord, is our desire and our design tonight. So we ask you to bless, reveal, breathe on your word. Holy Spirit, we know you've been here, but now, Holy Spirit, teach us this evening. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. These are two great, great psalms, very important, and we'll recognize how important they are because these next two psalms that we'll look at tonight, we'll do a lot of reading tonight. There's a lot of verses, but really it's self-explanatory. But just to, to kick off Psalm 105, God's promises to Israel demonstrate his faithfulness to us. God's promises to Israel demonstrate his faithfulness to us. And we'll see that. And let's review here in Psalm 105. Once we get through these psalms, you'll realize how it is a review. It's a look at Israel's history. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing psalms. To the Lord. Do you do that? Do you sing to the Lord? We need to do that more often. But the psalmist is saying, hey, sing unto the Lord. Bless him, praise him with music. Talk of all his wondrous works. Glory in his name. Let the hearts of those who rejoice, let the heart of those rejoice who seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face forevermore. Remember his marvelous works which he has done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. O oh, seed of Abraham, his servant, you children of Jacob, his chosen ones. And so the psalmist is Awakening the nation of Israel, remember the goodness of Jehovah God. And we can be invited into that likewise. We look at Israel's history, and again, we see God's faithfulness to the nation of Israel, and that is faithfulness to us. And what a blessing. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever, and that's the key. The Lord remembers his covenant, a covenant, a promise, a promise, the Lord's word. You shall be saved by the finished work of Jesus Christ. Call upon the Lord in your heart and let it come out of your mouth and when you do that, you shall be saved. What a blessing. He remembers his covenant, his promise forever. The word which he commanded for a thousand generations, the covenant which he made with Abraham and his oath to Isaac and confirmed it to Jacob for a statute to Israel as an everlasting covenant saying to you, nation of Israel, I will give the land of Canaan as the allotment of your inheritance. The land of Canaan, modern day Israel, the Lord promising that to Abraham and his descendants. And of course, we understand and recognize that that has been followed through. When they were few in number, in other words, when the nation of Israel were few in number, indeed very few, and strangers in it, when they went from one nation to another, from one kingdom to another people, he permitted no one to do them wrong. Yes, 
the Lord rebuked kings for their sakes, in other words, for the nation of Israel's sakes, saying, do not touch my anointed ones and do, and do my prophets no harm. So even when the nation of Israel, when Abraham was a wanderer, the Lord said, Abraham, leave all that you know and go in this direction. Well, where am I going, Lord? Never mind, just trust in me. Okay, Lord, I will. And the father of faith, Father Abraham, was obedient unto the Lord and God's covenant and promise to the people, the seed of Abraham, the nation of Israel, would be protected forever. Moreover, the Lord called for a famine in the land. He destroyed all the provision of bread. Yet he sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. And so while Abraham and his little family was in the land of Canaan, the famine came. Joseph eventually ended up in Egypt as a slave, but yet the Lord used that to save the nation of Israel. So as a slave, verse 18, they hurt Joseph's feet with fetters. In other words, they slapped the chains on Joseph. He was laid in irons until the time that his word came to pass. The word of the Lord tested him. Testings are of the Lord. Don't think and don't let anybody convince you that any time you come into a difficulty that it's, oh, it's of the devil. That's nonsense most of the time. The, so the word of the Lord tested Joseph. Joseph had a promise as a little boy, but now he finds himself in chains, and there were certainly times where Joseph must have been wondering, Lord, what's going on? And the Lord just comforted Joseph by saying, trust in me, Joseph, hang in there. Verse 20, eventually the king sent and released Joseph. The ruler of the people let him go free. He made Joseph Lord over his house and ruler of all his possessions. Pharaoh promoted Joseph to the highest rank of the land. To, and, and so Joseph was to bind Pharaoh's princes at his pleasure. In other words, Joseph was running the show. He was the, the, the man. And he was to teach Pharaoh's elders wisdom. The spirit-filled man, Joseph, Israel also came to Egypt, so eventually, as the famine in, in, in Jacob's day hit, they eventually made their way to Egypt, and Jacob dwelt in the land of Ham in Egypt. He increased his people greatly, the Lord increased the nation of Israel greatly, and made them stronger than their enemies. We remember the story, the Hebrew children were growing in population and in number, and that bothered the current Pharaoh. So verse 25, the Lord turned their heart to hate his own people, to deal craftily with his servants. Eventually, the Lord sent Moses, his servant, and Aaron, whom he had chosen. They performed the Lord's signs among the wicked and the wonders in the land of Ham. Once again, the land of Egypt. The Lord sent darkness and made it dark, and they did not rebel against his word. Now, a couple of ways that we need to look at this verse, they did not rebel against his word. Number one, it's possible that the word of God here is speaking. It's hard to translate the Hebrew uh, in a very comfortable way for us in modern day, so there's a few possibilities. First of all, they did not rebel uh, against uh, against uh, God's word, it may be speaking of Moses and Aaron. They may it might have been them just saying, "Great Lord, whatever you want to do, that's fine with me." Or they did not rebel against His word. It might possibly mean the nation of Israel it's themselves sitting comfortably, even though the plagues were being revealed. That's a possibility. 
A third possibility, and you can add 20 more if you like, because we don't really know. But another possibility is that as the plagues were being endured, as the Egyptian people would be sitting under these plagues, they came to a point several times saying, let's just let these Hebrew children free so we can be out from the curse of Jehovah God. And yet, once the, the plagues would stop, we recall as we look at the book of Exodus, once the plagues would stop, then Pharaoh would say, no, I'm not letting the children go. So we're not quite sure, but there you have it. They did not rebel against his word. Verse 29, the Lord turned their waters into blood and killed their fish. Their land abounded with frogs, even in the chambers of their kings. Can you imagine the king having frogs in his own bed? Not a good thing, the Pharaoh. The Lord spoke and there came swarms of flies and lice in all their territory. The Lord gave them hail for rain and flaming fire in their land. He struck their vines also and their fig trees and splintered the trees of their territory. The Lord spoke and the locusts came, young locusts without number, and they ate up all the vegetation in their land and devoured the fruit of their ground. And finally, the Lord also destroyed all the firstborn in their land, the first of all their strength. That was it. Pharaoh finally said, I, am, I have been defeated. Pharaoh was stubborn, hard-hearted, and prideful throughout this duo, duel, if you will, with the Lord, and it was a tragedy. Some have suggested with many of these plagues, the frogs, the flies, things like that, some have suggested that these were some of the items that the Egyptians led by the pharaohs were worshiping. And so the Lord says, oh, you like frogs, do you? <laughs> oh, you worship dead things and from them, from dead carcasses come flies. Oh, you like flies, do you? And so the Lord said, fine. Oh, you worship the, uh, the River Nile. Hmm. And can you imagine going out there and beginning to bathe and all of a sudden the water begins to turn to blood? The Lord's saying, hey, I'm God. Doesn't matter who you think is God, I'm God. Let me introduce myself to you. An amazing thing to consider. But we continue on in the psalm. Verse 37, the Lord finally, once the firstborn were taken, and of course the, the, the Hebrew nation was not touched by this. Those who had the Passover blood on their door was, was untouched by the, those families were untouched by the death angel. And so he also brought them out of bondage after 400 plus years out of bondage from Egypt. He brought them out with silver and gold and there was none feeble among the Lord's tribes. Elsewhere, the Lord announces the nation of Israel that had been in captivity, the army of the Lord, and they were God's army. Egypt was glad when the nation of Israel departed, for the fear of them had fallen upon them. The Lord spread a cloud for a covering and a fire to give light in the night. The people asked, and he brought quail and satisfied them with the bread of heaven. He opened the rock and water gushed out. It ran in the dry places like a river. Why? Because he remembered his holy promise and Abraham his servant. God's covenant God's promise. You are his, he is yours, and that is a promise that will remain forever as long as you have committed yourself to that reality. He cared for the people in the desert for he remembered his holy promise and Abraham his servant. 
He brought out his people with joy, his chosen ones with gladness. He gave them the lands of the Gentiles and they inherited the labor of the nations that they might observe his statutes and keep his laws. Oh, praise the Lord. Is there anything else that needs to be said after that? No, hardly. Psalm 106, as we continue, God's faithfulness, even forgiveness of Israel's sins. Even forgiveness of Israel's sins. Once again, praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Who can utter the mighty acts of the Lord? In other words, who can document all the great things God has done? Nobody can. There's not enough time in, the, in existence. Who can declare all his praise, the psalmist is asking. Blessed are those who keep justice and he who does righteousness at all times. Now, is there anybody here that does righteousness at all times? Nobody? Okay, just wanted to check. But through the, the prompting and the filling of the Holy Spirit, we are allowed to do the job that God has for us. Amen? Oh, remember me, O oh Lord, with the favor you have toward your people. Oh, visit me with your salvation that I may see the benefit of your chosen ones, that I may rejoice in the gladness of your nation, that I may glory with your inheritance. The whole point of God setting aside a chosen people was that he would bless that chosen people, that reputation, if you will, would go out worldwide and, the, and we observers would see, man, that Jehovah God is blessing these people, I wanna be a part of that. That was the whole point. And that's what the psalmist is saying. Let me see the benefit of your chosen ones. Let me observe your chosen people that I may glory with your inheritance. They'll invite me in. They'll give me a place at the, at the tabernacle, at the altar to praise Jehovah. Let me have that. Yet we have sinned with our fathers, Lord. We have committed iniquity. We have done wickedly. This is the... This is the, the, the psalmist humbling himself, himself. Our fathers in Egypt did not understand your wonders. They did not remember the multitude of your mercies, but rebelled at the sea, yes, at the Red Sea. So we just looked at Psalm 105 documenting the release of the nation of Israel, the Hebrew children. But here now in Psalm 106, a little behind the scene commentary. Oh, those that you brought out, they had a short memory, Lord. They, had, they didn't remember your goodness whatsoever. And even as early as the Red Sea, their hearts began to start turning back to Egypt. We touched on that a little bit, we remember on Sunday in the book of Hebrews. So we have, we have sinned with our fathers, Lord. Verse eight, nevertheless, he saved them for his name's sake that he might make his power known. That was the whole point with the standoff with Pharaoh. The Lord said, Pharaoh, you wanna fight against me? I don't recommend it, but I will use it to demonstrate my awesome power. I'll use you, hey, you wanna dance, Pharaoh? Great. I don't recommend it, but I will use your foolishness to make my power known. He rebuked the sea also, and it dried up. So he led them through the depths as through the wilderness. He saved them from the hand of him who hated them and redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. The waters covered their enemies. They, there was not one of them left. Then they believed his words. They sang his praise. Yet they soon 
forgot his works. They did not wait for his counsel, but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tested God in the desert. They soon forgot his works and did not wait for his counsel. Huge mistake. We can relate to that overwhelmingly in our lives. Verse 15, he gave them their request, but sent leanness into their soul. Jesus asked, what if a man wins the whole world, but loses his own soul? What a tragedy. Do not envy those that you look at that are being propped up and prompted to draw your attention saying, hey, this person's got it made. If they don't have Jesus Christ, that is a false statement. I don't care what their social status is. The Lord's saying here, oh, he gave them their heart's desire but sent leanness to their soul. Wow, that's heavy. When they envied Moses, in other words, when they looked at the leader in the camp and they looked at Aaron, the saint of the Lord, the earth opened up and swallowed Dathan and covered the faction of a Abiram. They looked and coveted position. Remember when Paul revealed, hey, I have held up all the commandment, commandments of the law except when I got to covetousness, that's an internal thing and when the Lord put his finger on my heart, I knew I was busted. The Apostle Paul coveted position. Saul of Tarsus, I should say, coveted position. And then when he became the Apostle Paul, if you will, after the Lord touched him, and Saul turned into the Apostle Paul, he of course changed, the Lord changed the Apostle's life. But as Saul of Tarsus, he coveted. Saul would have been one of these guys that envied Moses. He'd be one of these guys that envied Aaron and said, you know what, let's knock him out of his position. And we can do better than that. We can do better than him. Maybe you can, but you weren't called by God. Whoa. And so here these men rose up as, be, as we're being reminded through this history and the earth opened up and swallowed these men. A fire was kindled in their company and the flame burned up the wicked. Verse 19, the children of Israel made a calf in Horeb. Remember when Moses went up, hung around with the Lord for 40 days and all of a sudden the people said, hey Aaron, we don't know where Moses is. Well, Bring us a, a leader. And the golden calf all of a sudden came to fruition. So they made, the golden, they made the calf in Horeb and worshiped the molded image. Thus they changed their glory. Human glory made in the image of God, they changed the image of God technically into the image of an ox that eats grass. You and I made in the image of God, in other words, having the ability to, to, to deal and to reason and to think. We have that image of the Lord, that ability to give compassion, that ability to love. And yet, the based reality of a calf was created and that calf, that dumb calf, that, that literal calf that was lifeless was all of a sudden replaced for Jehovah in worship. An amazing thing, the, God the Holy Spirit is just documenting this, saying, hey, you're not exempt. If you're breathing, you're not exempt from this. Inventory, and be careful as you do. They forgot their God, verse 21, their Savior, who had g done great things in Egypt. Wondrous works in the land of Ham, awesome things by the Red Sea. They forgot it. Therefore, the Lord said that he would destroy them. Now had not Moses, his chosen one, stood before the Lord in the breach to turn away his wrath, lest he should destroy them. So the Lord 
Uh, excuse me, Moses truly laid his life down for his congregation. As the plague was going through the, the nation of Israel, Moses stepped in and said, please, Lord, won't you have mercy? And Moses knew how to get God's attention. And, and the Lord said, I will relent at this time. Then they despised the pleasant land, verse 24. They did not believe the Lord's word, but complained in their tents and did not heed the voice of the Lord. Therefore, once again, the Lord raised up his hand in an oath against them to overthrow them in the wilderness, to overthrow their descendants among the nations and to scatter them in the land. Later in history, they joined themselves also to Baal, and Baal of Peor and ate sacrifices made to the dead, completely forgetting the Lord. Thus they provoked the Lord to anger with their deeds and the plague broke out among them. Then Phineas, now this is several generations removed from Moses, Phineas at that time stood up and intervened and the plague was stopped. So Phineas knew the heart of the Lord by studying the words of Moses. And so Phineas stepped in and the plague was stopped. And that was accounted to Phineas for righteousness to all generations forevermore. It's documented in the Word of God, and the Word of God lasts forever. Furthermore, in verse 32, they angered him also at the waters of strife so that it went ill with them on account, with Moses on account of them because they rebelled against his spirit so that he spoke rashly with his lips. And so when the people were complaining toward the end of the wilderness wandering, complaining once again, 40 years of complaining and Moses is getting pretty worn out. Moses goes to the tabernacle and says, Lord, what do you want me to do with your people? They need water. And the Lord says, no problem, Moses. I'll take care of it. You just go and speak to the rock. Speak to it. And out of it, it'll gush water. And so Moses came out of the tabernacle and Moses was wound up. He was mad. And Moses, against his instruction, took his staff and beat the rock and said, what am I supposed to do with you people? And he started beating the rock. That was not what the Lord said. He said, Moses, speak to the rock. And Moses beat the rock. But in God's goodness, God still opened up and allowed the, the waters to gush out. And the people were satisfied with water. But that costly mistake kept Moses' foot out of the promised land. Man, can you imagine wandering for 40 years and then being that close to stepping into the promised land and Moses was told by the Lord, sorry Moses, you misrepresented me. You didn't show who I really am. You made it seem like I was mad at the people and I'm not mad at the people. But you made it seem like I was. And Moses, that's gonna cost you. You cannot go into the promised land. But Lord, no, no, Moses, we're done. Conversation is over. I will give you mercy. I will allow you to observe the land from the mountain, but you will not step one foot into it. Joshua, your man, will lead my people. Wow, costly mistake. God help us not rep misrepresent you, Lord God. Let us not be casual with our representation of God. That can be very costly. Very costly. Be very careful. Lord help us, especially us as leaders. Verse 34, they did not destroy the people concerning whom the Lord had commanded. Instead of destroying those wicked nations, the nation of Israel mingled with the Gentiles and learned their works. Entering into the promised land, the Lord says, wipe everyone out. In other words, there's no hope for these folks. 
and I'm being merciful to you, my cho chosen people, to give you the direction to wipe out these wicked people because otherwise you're going to be completely polluted. And they didn't listen and they mingled, in other words, in marriage and lifestyle and learned their works. God's chosen people served the Gentile idols which became a snare to them. We remember Solomon was totally overwhelmed by the amount of women that he had in his life. And those women stole his heart and taught him how to worship Gentile idols. And it became a snare to Solomon, just as we see here in our psalm. Verse 37, it can't get any more horrific than verse 37. They even sacrificed their sons and their daughters to demons. I mean... I hope we can't imagine, but for a second, what a horrifying thought that would be. God's chosen people ignoring his direction and then mingling with the wicked of the world and finally getting to the spot to where they sacrifice their own sons and daughters to demons. Yes, they shed innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan and the land was polluted with blood. Thus, they were defiled by their own works and played the harlot by their own deeds. What a tragedy. Therefore, because of all this, because of their own choosing, the wrath of the Lord was kindled against his people so that he abhorred his own inheritance. And he gave them into the hand of the Gentiles and to those who hated them to rule over them. Their enemies also oppressed them and they were brought into subjection under their hand. Now many times he delivered them as we go through the book of Judges. We see the up and the down. The, the, the downtime when finally people would begin to come to their senses and they'd cry out to the Lord. And the Lord would bring them a godly judge for a period of time. And then it was like, oh, praise the Lord. It's much like when we go to the jail and I go and Pastor Jim goes and one of our elders go to the jail and say, hey, you know, we're gonna pray for you to, to see if the Lord would uh, allow you to get out of jail at a particular time. And then all of a sudden the Lord would spring that person and they'd come to the fellowship one time and say, wow, the Lord sprung me out of jail, it was amazing. It's like, great brother, you, so we'll expect to see you fellowship in here, never see him again. And so there's a lot of confessions in jail and we've been there too. We've done plenty of confessions in that jail cell, haven't we? But boy, how quickly we forget. How quickly our carnal desires are being tempted and we follow those carnal desires that lead us away from the worship of, of the Lord. And that's what happened here. The carnal desires overwhelmed and drew God's people away. So many times he delivered them, but then over a period of time they rebelled in their counsel and they were brought low once again for their iniquity. Up and down, up and down, no way to live. Nevertheless, the Lord regarded his people's affliction when he heard their cry. And for their sake, once again, the Lord remembered his covenant. He remembered his promise and relenting according to the multitude of his mercies because he promised Abraham. And he didn't break that promise. I will always keep a remnant of your people. He also made them to be pitied by all those who carried them away cap captive. And finally the psalmist says, save us, O, our, save us, o Lord, our God. Save us and gather us from among the Gentiles to give thanks to your holy name, to triumph in your praise. So even after all this, Lord God, you have not forgive, forgotten or forsaken us. Save now, Lord. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting, and let all the people say, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. If I could have the worship team join me. 
This is just a great history of Israel's wanderings, their ups and downs, but seeing the consistency and the faithfulness of the Lord God. That's why the Spirit of God has written these paragraphs and these scriptures to us, the Gentile church, to be reminded of God's goodness and to, be, to remind anybody and everybody breathing that God is good, but if you rebel against him, you'll get your way. You will win that fight. If you want to rebel against God, he will allow you to be victorious. Not a good thing. Not a good thing. So we are only able to genuinely say amen when we remember. So tonight, remember where God brought you from. Remember, and I know you do, but tonight, put that in your head, and then once you bring that to your memory, you can say, genuinely say, Lord, amen. Thank you, Lord. And so that's what our meeting is about tonight. The history of the nation of Israel applied in our own lives. We say thank you, Lord, and amen to that. Praise the Lord. Amen. Join us by standing. And Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for your goodness. And with the nation of Israel, your chosen people, you have shown your faithfulness even when your chosen people could get no lower, sacrificing their own babies, something you never would even come across your thinking. And yet, your people in their rebellion ran from you and ran and learned these abominable practices and thought that that would be something worthwhile. But yet, Lord, you never gave up. And that, Lord, we take away tonight. There's not a thing that we have done or will do that will make you turn your back on us. Now, we can turn our backs on you, yes. But there is nothing that we have done or will ever do to turn you from us as demonstrated through the history of the nation of Israel God, your chosen people. Thank you for that comfort, Lord. Let us reflect on your goodness. Let us be reminded of all that you've done for us. And then and only then we can genuinely shout, Amen. Thank you, Father, for this night. You, Lord God, are the rock of ages. And in that rock, we find our salvation. Through the finished work of Christ, your promise we receive in Jesus' name. Amen.